This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on Insurance. I am an attorney who has retired from the active practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant and expert witness, a author and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to talk about Benjamin Franklin and American insurance. Not content with the titles of statesman, scientist, inventor, or author, Benjamin Franklin added insurer to his collection. In 1752, the Philadelphia contributorship for the insurance of houses from loss by fire became the first mutual fire insurance company in America. Much like London in the 1600s, Houses at this time were made almost entirely out of wood. Worse yet, the settlements that grew into the cities were built close together. This was originally done for security reasons, but as cities grew, developers built homes very close to each other for the same reasons they do today, to fit as many houses as possible on their development plots. The contributorship, as is now its common reference, was a proactive insurance carrier, refusing to provide coverage to houses and other structures that were not constructed according to strict building standards. During the British occupation of Philadelphia in 1777, the contributorship hired a chimney sweep to maintain the chimneys of insured houses that were still occupied by people it insured. Property insurance, as it is known in modern usage, can be traced back to the Great Fire of London, which in 1666 devoured more than 13,000 houses. The devastating effects of the fire converted the development of insurance from a matter of convenience into one of urgency, a change of opinion reflected in Sir Christopher Wren's inclusion of a site for the insurance office in his new plan for London in 1667. The New York Fire of 1835 called attention to the need for adequate reserves to meet unexpectedly large losses. Massachusetts was the first state to require insurance companies by law to maintain such reserves in a statute enacted in 1837. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 emphasized the costly nature of fires in structurally dense modern cities. Reinsurance, where losses are distributed among many companies, was devised to meet such situations and is now common in other lines of insurance. The Workmen's Compensation Act of 1897 in Britain required employers to insure their employees against industrial accidents. Public liability insurance, fostered by legislation, made its appearance in the 1880s. It attained major importance with the advent of the automobile. In the wake of Mr. Franklin's first successful venture, many similar companies were founded in the following decades to provide insurance to people whose homes were potential losses due to fire. Initially, each company employed its own fire department to prevent and minimize the damage from conflagrations on properties insured by them. And those fire departments would simply refuse to fight fires at homes not insured. The key to insurance, even the insurance provided by Mr. Franklin, is the spreading of risk from one person to many. As early as 300 B.C., 
The Babylonians developed a system of loans for shipments by sea, where the loan was not repayable if the ship was lost. Merchants found the risks of shipping by sea to be too great to take a loan, since the loss of one ship could bankrupt a merchant. With insurance, the risk of shipping was equitably spread among those subscribing to the loan. These early versions of marine insurance were more like a modern football pool than insurance as we know it now. A stakeholder would simply hold the bets of the merchants, the premium, until the ship returned to port. If it did not return, the stake would be paid out to the merchant whose cargo was lost. If it did return, the stake was paid out to the other merchants who earned a healthy profit on their gamble. Since the merchants were betting on each other's success, the loss of one ship could be absorbed by the entire merchant community. To convince a merchant to take the risk, the ship owner, the insured, was required to fit within the definition of an honorable person who would never take advantage of the merchants issuing the insurance since, with no modern communications and with information only available from he who sought the insurance, fraud was easy. The ship could go to the West Indies, be sold and renamed with the insured collecting the insurance by reporting the vessel sunk. Insurers relied on the ethics of the person seeking insurance as a major reason for agreeing to insure more, so even the requirement that the ship be seaworthy. Insurance in some form is as old as historical society. So-called bottom rate contracts were known to merchants of Babylon as early as 4 to 3000 BCE. Bottom rate was also practiced by the Hindus in 600 BCE and was well understood in ancient Greece as early as the 4th century BCE. Under a bottom contract, loans were granted to merchants with the provision that if the system was lost at sea, the loan did not have to be repaid. The interest on the loan covered the insurance risk. Ancient Roman law recognized the bottom contract in which an article of agreement was drawn up and funds were deposited with a money changer. Marine insurance became highly developed in the 15th century, and by spreading the risk, trade by sea became economically viable. The covenant of good faith and fair dealing is a general assumption of the law of contracts that people will act in good faith and deal fairly with each other without breaking their word. When insurers use shifty means to avoid obligations or deny what other party obviously understood was a violation of the duty of good faith, the covenant with regard to insurance has been implied in every contract of insurance since the beginning of modern insurance at the Lloyd's Coffee Shop more than 300 years ago. The implied duty of good faith and fair dealing is a centuries-old concept. It is aimed at ensuring that the parties to a contract do not interfere with the other party's performance or destroy the other party's reasonable expectations with respect to the benefits of the contract. Given that the duty has been in place for hundreds of years and is firmly rooted in the common law, it is unlikely that it will disappear in the near future. The implied duty of good faith and fair dealing protects the abilities of the parties to rely on their contract, the promises and risks undertaken, and the parties' reasonable expectations. The Covenant of Good Faith is based upon what to 
modern man might consider ancient court rulings, where Lord Mansfield, sitting in the House of Lords, acting as the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, found that an ethical underwriter with knowledge of the risks being taken equal to or better than that of the person insured could not in good faith claim that material facts were concealed from him because utmost good faith required the underwriter to use his superior knowledge to favor the insured. In a case called Whitcomb v. Whiting and Carter v. Beam, Lord Mansfield sitting in the House of Lords, acting as the Supreme Judicial Court of England, held in 1766 that an admission by one joint debtor was the admission of all and that the law raises a promise to pay when the debt is admitted to be due. It is no answer for a person insured to say that the error or suppression of a material fact was the result of mistake, accident, forgetfulness, or inadvertence. It is enough that the insurer has been misled, and has thus been induced to enter into a contract which, if it had received the correct and full information, the insurer would either have declined or would have accepted insurance upon different terms. Even if no fraud was intended by the person insured, it is nevertheless a fraud upon the underwriter and makes the policy void. The insurer who fails to act ethically empowers the ethical insurer to declare the policy void as a result of this deception. Surprisingly, this statement of the law going back to the early 18th century has been codified in California and New York and various other states that apply what is known as the Marine Rule, as originally stated by Lord Mansfield back in 1766. Ethical underwriters and claims persons should never use technicalities to reach a decision on a policy or a loss. Rather, the ethical underwriter or claims person must apply the facts to the issue raised and provide the indemnity promised. Similarly, the insured must also clearly, fairly, and completely advise the underwriter of all the facts known or that he should know that is material to the decision of the insurer to accept or reject the risk. The California Court of Appeal explained the situation as follows, quote, An insurance company is entitled to determine for itself what risks it will accept and therefore to know all the facts relevant to the applicant's physical condition. The insurer has the unquestioned right to select those whom it will insure and to rely upon him who would be insured for such information as it desires as a basis for its determination to the intent and to the end that a wise discrimination may be exercised in selecting its risks. This is Robinson v. Occidental Life, a 1955 decision of the California Court of Appeal. An insurer can only exercise that wise discrimination in selecting its risks if it deals with an ethical insured who makes known to the insurer all of the facts relevant to the risk 
the applicant is asking the insurer to assume. Demonstrating high moral and ethical standards are vital to success in the insurance business. Insurers that have a clear vision based on ethical practices should be more successful over the long term than organizations whose personnel fail to act ethically. Ethical insurers seldom face litigation for the tort of bad faith or for breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing and should never see a verdict concluding the insurer breached the covenant. At most, if they dispute an obligation under a policy of insurance, they are compelled to pay the indemnity promised by the contract if proved to be wrong. Unethical insurers who breach the covenant are compelled by the tort of bad faith to pay contract and tort damages. Ethical values in an organization like an insurer are logically connected with the success of the organization. Success follows ethical behavior because the insurer that stresses high ethical standards will also stress quality, fair, and thorough claim service. It is quality claim service that the contract of insurance promises. The insurer that provides consistent quality insurance claim service will usually be successful over a period of time. The business of insurance cannot be graded based on its success over a three-month period. Rather, the success of an insurer is best graded upon its operations over at least three decades. This video was adapted from my book, Ethics for the Insurance Professional Second Edition, which is available as both a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be interesting to you or to your colleagues, please refer it to them. It's free. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, and my blog so that you can be advised of future blogs and videos. Thank you for your attention.